I'd like to say good evening and uh, welcome you to this Milano management event. Um, I'm Mary Watson, as, as Bonnie said, I'm chair of the management programs, which for those of you who are alums uh, now include the uh, master's program in nonprofit management, which has been around for about 30 years, and the uh, master's program in organization change management, which has been in existence for about 10 years. We're also in the process of developing and rolling out some new areas and some new programs in sustainability and the environment. We're doing more additional coursework in arts management and cultural policy, uh, in social entrepreneurship, and also in global and international. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you tonight to our, our two speakers who are going to be talking about You Are What You Tweet. Now I have to look at that because I don't really uh, understand those acronyms. Um, personal Branding and Social Media. Um, Bonnie McEwen, who's a full-time member of the management faculty and is also president of the organization Make Waves, a uh, website known as Make Waves, Not Noise. Uh, Bonnie is a, is a really... Um, a uh, strident supporter of a variety of, um, of rights issues, and she's working now currently with clients including the Open Society issue and the Funders for Gay and Lesbian issues. She was formerly uh, Executive Vice President at Douglas Gould and Company, uh, and she um, was uh, leading the firm's practice in economic and social justice there. Bonnie's been in a top communications position at both the Girl Scouts of America and the Planned Parenthood Federation and has been part of our part-time faculty member for 12 years at Milano, including serving as the acting chair of Milano's nonprofit management program. So we're delighted to have um, Bonnie here with us tonight. She's also an alumnus of the non nonprofit program. And uh, joining Bonnie is a newer alumnus, uh, Farah Trompeter, who um, is now a member of our part-time faculty, teaching a course in online engagement, uh, 15 years of experience in communications and fundraising in nonprofits, and currently vice president of Client Relationships and Strategy at Big Duck. That's uh, big, BigDuckNYC.com. Uh, Farah really specializes in helping nonprofits use all aspects of the internet and social media. Uh, she led online engagement at Douglas Gould and & Company and was a senior account executive at Donor Digital. Uh, this is one of the, when I first met uh, Farah, she was working with Donor Digital, looking at online marketing and fundraising and advocacy. She's on the board of the New York City Anti-Violence Project and makes uh, many presentations at conferences, including the Nonprofit Technology Network, the Association for Fundraising Professionals, and the Support Center. Farah is also an alumnus of the New School and of the Milano Nonprofit Management Program. So we're delighted to have you here tonight, and without further ado, I'll turn this over to Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, okay, you are what you tweet. Um, I say that because, in a very real way, what you are online is how you are perceived. And as someone said in the um, beginning of the, um, when we were just chatting, uh, it's, it's about having an image and taking control over that image so that you can exercise a measure of control. But um, how did we get here? I think it's, it's a important to understand not just how to use this technology, but what does it mean that we got here and how did that happen? Um, the short story is, is that technology is not neutral. It creates a lot of seismic shifts in the way that we do business, in the way we communicate, in the way we get educated, in the way we uh, enjoy culture and leisure activities. So there's a couple of um, of points that I think are really critical for social media. The first is that digital technology creates what Thomas Friedman, uh, in his wonderful book, uh, I think it was he first used this term, in the Lexus and the Olive Tree. He talked about super empowered individuals. And what that means is that because of technology, one person can actually have a really outsized influence because now technology makes it possible to reach out to very many other people. And um, it doesn't really care whether you're accurate or not, whether you have good intentions or not. Um, so a guy like Matt Drudge, for instance, can become a relatively well-known celebrity um, and become a super empowered individual thanks to the technology. He, um, none of these individuals, uh, Daily Koss or any of these, 
blogs would have been possible and their influence possible if it hadn't have been for the technology. Um, along with that comes, the, this is a really, a real, real biggie, is the death of advertiser-supported content. Um, with broadcasting becoming narrow casting and the audience fragmenting, we all have options now we didn't have because of technology. We can fast forward through commercials, we can record things and watch them later. We, a lot of us watch television on the internet. We don't even have, I mean, I found it really interesting. A lot of my students told me a couple of semesters ago, we don't even have TV. You know, we, we are very intentional about what we watch. So they didn't know from the TV schedule. Some of us who were a little older you know, used to have to remember that on Tuesday night was some show you wanted to watch. Not so much anymore. And therefore, because you don't have broadcasters and you don't have newspapers that can guarantee readership, the New York Times can't guarantee all those subscribers anymore because a lot of us just go online and read the stuff for free. So why should we you know, subscribe to a newspaper? Uh, advertisers are not going to pay big bucks unless you can guarantee that they're going to get their message in front of a certain number of people and also um, around a certain kind of content. You've probably noticed newspapers are a lot shorter these days than they used to be. Why is that? Because every single page of news has to have advertising to support it. And if you don't have advertisers, you cut back on the news. What's that mean for those of us who are starting businesses or who uh, rely on publicity because we're a nonprofit organization? It means that the news hole is increasingly small and the competition for um, so-called earned media, as in not paid for, right? Uh, it becomes very, very steep. So it has a lot of fallout in addition to advertisers being um, in upheaval around this. Uh, many, many other facets of life are up in the air because we don't know now what, what's going to support content. Who's going to pay for the creative content that we watch? Um, so you've got that causing the decline of traditional media. Media comes from the term mediate, right? The media were the intermediaries. They were the they mediated the sea of information out there and helped us access only that information we wanted. So a journalist was a mediator. If I know that I'm really interested in the kind of uh, stuff that uh, Thomas Friedman writes in the New York Times, or if I'm interested in women and girls' rights in the developing world, I know that I can read Nick, Nick Kristoff in the Times and he's gonna tell me about it. Um, but increasingly, there are fewer and fewer mediators. So that means that we're all awash in this sort of sea of madness called the internet, and you have to mediate your own content. So that's not possible. How are you gonna read everything and only pick out the wheat from the chaff? Um, social media perhaps can help us fill that role. The other thing I think is interesting is that um, long ago, you know, um, money, eh, money changes everything, right? Um, and it always drives all kinds of innovation. And so e-commerce, not surprisingly, created, I think, the first sort of proto-social networks. I've been a book reviewer on Amazon for a long time. And I can remember quite a while ago when Amazon really started one of the first social communities where you went on and you talked about books. And the same with eBay, and people were really into getting eBay stars and all of this kind of stuff. So it was a natural segue to where we are now, which is we've got these social media and we can help each other. If uh, I know that um, you know, Deva likes uh, stories about uh, gay and lesbian rights and I see something really interesting, I can tweet that and if she follows my tweet, I've just mediated for her. So I've helped her swim through the, the sea of madness. Um, and that the same is true for Facebook. LinkedIn is a little bit more professional kind of a site, it's more of a job search site, um, but you can make contacts on LinkedIn that will connect you with people you don't know. If Farah knows somebody I don't know, I can write to Farah and say, how about introducing me to the person you know? So again, it's, uh, it's serving in a way as the sort of you know, local village green where there's the band shell and everybody hangs out on Saturday and gets to know people. Well, this is sort of the village green. Uh, Flickr is for sharing still photos, and YouTube is for sharing videos. Same principle. Okay, so there's been a lot of shifts in employment. 
because of this. The jab market's digital. Um, those of you who are a little older, remember the New York Times on Sunday was all you needed to find a jab, right? I got my jab in the New York Times, you know, for years and years. Huge advertising campaign. Now you hardly see any jabs. Why? Because they're all online. Um, I looked up recently. I, this blows me away. From 18 to 38 years old, the average person will now have 10 jobs. Probably close to that. 10 jobs. Right, <laughs> right. I counted up how many I've had. I've had a lot more than many people who are in my age group. Um, but if you're going to have 10 jobs uh, between the time you're 18 and 38, you're probably going to have several careers as well. And many of us sitting here today have done exactly that. Um, and also, whether you are, are online or not, your information is online. I, you know, I can plug in a you know, generic Google search. I can plug in, you know, some, like if I plug in Farah's name, I'm inundated with, with hits. You know, hopefully that's a good thing for her. You know, same for me. I'm, I want, when somebody plugs in my name, I want all these places to come up because I want to, I use social media to get business for my company, consulting business. Um, but if you are shy and you don't want to be on online, you probably are anyway. I can, I plugged in, I have a brother who's like a freeze-dried hippie. He's an organic farmer in upstate New York. He doesn't even, you know, he barely tolerates having a phone, right? I plug his name in, comes up, not only his name, his birth date, his age, probable relatives, I'm there, you know. I mean, it's really a little, little scary in a way. Or you go on Amazon and the first thing you see is if you bought this, you might like that, you know. So, so your information is online whether, whether you're online or not. Um, the other thing is employers, your friends, expect you to be digitally literate. And that didn't used to be the case. I have to tell you, if you don't have an email account, I don't communicate with you. I cannot be bothered to deal with people who aren't online. You know, it's just, you know, I write a letter, I, I can't do that. I'm too busy. So um, there, there are people who are somewhat less extreme than that, but generally speaking, your employer definitely expects you to be digitally literate. So there's more noise, there's more people online, there's less mediation. Also, there's a blurring between friends and contacts. Cracks me up, you know, I've got, I don't know, 700 Facebook friends, right? Um, but they're really, they're really sort of acquaintances or contacts. But I wouldn't, I don't think it's fair to say, well, it's just a network thing and they're only contacts. Because I've actually made some pretty good friends who I've never laid eyes on in real time. And I, you know, that's happened on Facebook. A friend of a friend, and you know, I'm I'm engaged in a, you know, uh, death-defying uh, Scrabble match with her, or something like that, you know. So it does facilitate a lot of things that, you know, I there are many. I I play Scrabble with people in Australia, you know, and uh, and it's fun, you know. And I never would have had that opportunity to have that exchange, and you chat while you play, and. And that kind of thing builds bonds, you know, beyond the neighborhood, beyond the national identity. Um, because of that, there's a demand for transparency. People really punish you if you are false online. If you're in a, a role-playing game, that's a different thing. If you're, um, you know, in Second Life or something. But they really expect people to be transparent. If Every time I go online to write something complimentary about Farah, I make it a point to say that she works at Big Duck and I sometimes do business with Big Duck. Um, why? Because one, it's honest, and two, it makes my recommendation more authentic because I'm not trying to hide something. Okay, so your identity is online, you should be too. Um, so it's frame or be framed, and that's the truth. The first person out of the box gets to set the terms of the debate. And you see this all the time. The, the best one is uh, the Republicans framing um, this, these tax cuts as tax relief. And that's totally brilliant. Because if I use the term tax relief, embedded in that term is the assumption that taxes must be oppressive. So I've just gotten my core idea across just through the terminology I use by the way I framed it. And the same thing will happen to you. So you really do want to brand yourself in social media so that other people don't do that branding for you. 
I'm so tired of hearing people say to me, oh, Twitter, what do I care what you're doing right now? Well, you know, that's because Twitter's not about that. They used to say Twitter was what are you doing right now, but what it really is, it's what you're thinking right now. You tweet about what you're thinking or something interesting that you read. It's a great forum for exchanging ideas. And the reason I like it so much, it's 140 characters. So I don't have to belabor how I'm saying something. I don't have to worry about am I choosing the right word. I think particularly in, at least in nonprofit organizations, but I suspect in all organizations, we labor far too much over wordsmithing and fretting over if we've gotten exactly the right word. And Twitter kind of frees you from that. And I think it's, especially if you're a person, I have a client, um, some of you may recognize her name. Her name is Faye Waddleton, and she's an activist and, and an interesting person who has about an idea a second, right? And never actually sits down to actually write anything that she's had all these ideas about. So Twitter's perfect for Faye because Faye can put out her idea, engage people, get feedback, and, and it's a very uh, fast, efficient process. Um, isn't Facebook just a way to waste time? I hear that all the time. Actually, no. It's about building relationships, whether it's playing Scrabble or, well, Farrah Fair will talk more about this, but I'm telling you, if I get one more email from Farrah Trumpeter about why I should give money to AVP, I'm going to run screaming from the room because every week she's on Facebook. I just raised $1,500 for them Did last you? week. Right. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> um, but she's a person who uses Facebook and builds relationships so that she can promote the causes that she cares about. And that's a really important thing. Okay. Um, other oppor there, there are some opportunities here, too. Opportunities that we wouldn't have had before without this digital technology. And the best is there's fewer gatekeepers, so you get more access. Um, you know, you got Rick, what's his name, Rick Sanford, is that the guy on CNN? Uh, Don Lemon. They're, they're all giving you their Twitter address. They're all putting their email out there. I can send in my I video or something to CNN. Um, I you know, reporter. I reporter, maybe, yeah. You know, so if, if there's a when, when there were those floods over in New Jersey, all these people were sending in video and CNN was putting it up. Um, it's, a, it's a much more interesting world now that I don't have to wade through six layers uh, you know, of people plus a security guard to talk to somebody at the New York Times. It's very, very cost effective. Um, I have a virtual company. If you go online and you look at my website, it looks pretty good. You, know? you don't necessarily have to know that you know, I'm, you know, working out of my apartment in Brooklyn, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, free medium because you can easily create the visuals and the audio to go with the, the ideas that you have, as opposed to I, I started my career in television. It's a real headache because you can't really have a really great idea. If I want to talk about a big rock candy mountain or something on TV, I have to actually make it so that I can show it. Um, online, it's just so much easier because I can upload pictures, I can play around with graphics and do many things. And I can update it immediately. Um, if anything changes, I can immediately go online and change my website. Uh, so these are just some, some little ways to track metrics. Um, but the other thing I love about the, uh, the social media is that there's um, free, freedom from geography. I work really closely with people who don't even live in New York City. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can as assess your impact. Farah, I'm sure, is going to talk about that. Um, Google Analytics, Bitly, lots of ways to track. And the other thing is it's, it's all in real time. So if for s some reason, um, especially this is good for a company, if somebody writes something about your company and um, it's a complaint or whatever, you're right there. You can address that. You don't have to just live with it forever. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's also about being transparent and authentic, is where you can actually say, oh, I'm so sorry that you had that experience. How can I fix that? And people will see that you're sincere and, and trying to make things better. Um, so actions to take. Um, this is just an example of um, a couple of my profiles, my Twitter and my Facebook. Um, Essentially, premeditate your profiles. Think about why are you online? 
you know, what is your purpose? You know, I'm online, I have a lot of fun, and I, you know, make friends and influence people and all that, but my bottom line is I'm online to drive business to my company. I, I want consulting clients, and that's why I'm online. And everything about anything that I put online goes into feeding this image that I am trying to create about the uh, kind of consultant I am and the kind of clients I want. So I have a little fun with it because I don't want clients that are uptight. I don't want, you know, I don't want clients who uh, don't like gay people, you know. I, I don't want, I'm tired of that. I paid my dues already, you know. Um, I'm going to be who I am and I'm going to be online and I'm going to craft that profile so that it attracts the people that I want to attract. Um, and so I know what my objective is. I have three main messages that I put out there and one way or another. It might not, I hope it's not obvious. And um, I, I'm very careful to make sure that every single thing that I ever say online is consistent with the image that I'm trying to put out. Um, okay, uh, the other thing is be generous with resources and knowledge. I think that's really important. Um, we always used to say part of the way you got good media attention was you were a good source and you passed the reporter on to other um, information. It's particularly true online. You know, if I see somebody who's asking a question on, you know, a listserv and they want to know how to do X, Y, Z, um, I'm happy to tell them. I, it, it's much less, for me anyway, it's much less about, you know, being in competition with other consultants. I really think that if we build up the, the general image of consultants, especially nonprofit consultants, because that's my thing. Um, I, yeah, I really do believe that a rising tide lifts all boats, and it's much better to be collegial, share information, and then, you know, when, when, when your supposed competitor ends up with too many clients and they can't handle them, they'll, they'll kick them over to you. you know? There's so many small um, businesses. Um, that it, it's just much easier to be collegial and share. You'll also notice that I try to keep certain things on all my profiles consistent. Like I've been using the same picture. I used to change the picture all the time because it amused me. Um, and I still might go back to that, but now I'm into using the same picture so that people will realize that it's the same person. I essentially believe that my company brand and my name are the same thing. So I treat my company Make Waves and my name, um, my own rep. I treat those as synonymous. Not everybody will want to do that, but that's just my strategy. Now, Farah <laughs> is going to explain exactly how you really go about doing this against this backdrop of change. And then afterwards, we'll take questions and have a discussion. Uh, so while I'm getting my presentation up, if you are tweeting, uh, Bonnie is Make Waves Bonnie, and I'm Farah, F as in Frank, A-R-R-A. -R -A. If you want to give us some shout outs or, you know, or not, we'll try and monitor the back channel should there be other questions. Um, and I also wanted to say, and I'll show you the URL at the end of my presentation, Bonnie and I have our presentations online, so if you want to download them or review them later, we'll be making sure you're able to do that. And as Bonnie mentioned, we will be doing some Q&A at the end. And then we're going to pass the basket. Exactly. You, guys will all throw you can also tell box. who's a Mac person, who's a PC <laughs> okay, here. AVP is the Anti Violence Project. Okay. The New York City Anti Violence Project, it's an organization that works on preventing violence within um, and against the gay and lesbian community here in New York. And I'm on their board, so I'm often promoting their, their excellent work. Um, so I'm going to sort of piggyback on some of what Bonnie talked about and also give you some sort of actionable steps. Uh, there's a book I wanted to mention that is probably one of the only books actually about this topic since it's a relatively new field. It's called Me 2.0. Um, this guy, Dan Schwebel, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, um, he sort of has positioned himself as the sort of guru of personal branding and social media. Um, so I'll actually, I'd like it back. It's my personal copy. I'll pass it around if anybody wants to look at it. Um, he was recently interviewed, and I like these, these sort of ideas. You know, first of all, people are searching for experts just like you, and you'll miss opportunities if you're not there. So those of you who, who are thinking about the fact that you run a business 
and your name is synonymous with that business like Bonnie mentioned, or even just you're looking for a job and you're trying to put yourself out there. If you come up there, you know, if I Google, you know, nonprofit fundraising expert in New York, and your name comes up there and that's what you're doing and you're a, a freelance grant writer, it'd be great if you come up for that, right? Because people are looking for you. Uh, the other idea is that at this point, um, the internet is becoming a way to amplify your voice. Just like Bonnie said, you are who you are. Offline, Bonnie and I both share the belief in being authentic and being real. So just like I might meet you today in this room or I meet you, you know, down the street or in a classroom and I get a sense of who you are, that sense should somehow trickle out when I meet you online. And if it's different, it sort of feels a little bit awkward and makes me even question you and possibly not even trust you. And trust is also a real sort of capital these days. Um, so what are your goals with social media? This is a, you know, shout them out. I've, I've, I put some, some ideas on here. One is be a thought leader. I, I, that's one of the main reasons how I use social media. I try and establish myself as this sort of leader and really understanding how nonprofits use online tools and social media to raise money and create change and market themselves. So a lot of what I put out there are around those ideas. Um, but as Bonnie mentioned, you can use it to develop community, um, get a job or help other people get one, or even generate business or support like donations, as we talked about. Are there any other goals of how you might use social media um, for yourself? Anybody have thoughts? Has anybody thought about this before coming to this <laughs> workshop? Has anyone sort of, as Bonnie said, sort of premeditating and going into your use of social media with, this is what I want to get out of it? Yeah. So what are your goals? I use my social media to promote the nonprofit I work for. Great. Um, and to promote the ideas that we do espouse. Um, and to, and to encourage people to take lifestyle choice, make lifestyle choices that are consistent with the values that I want them to. What nonprofit do you work for? Farm Sanctuary. Nice. Or animal protection nonprofit. Great. And you do a great job on Facebook. Yeah. I love all the Yeah. Really yeah. Good. Great. So sort of really taking the, the mission of the organization that you work for and really putting it out there because you believe so passionately about it. Any other goals that people have or thought about having with social media? Yeah. Yep, that's a, a group now on Facebook, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, what's interesting is thinking about, on the sort of flip side about this, going to what Bonnie said, and I'll talk about this more, you know, when you put something online, it's there. So let's say I sign that pledge or that petition, people will know that I'm against this legislation and that I don't think it's right. Now, that's probably not surprising if you meet me and talk to me for five minutes. Um, but if I was worried about a career in a certain area, you know, if I, if I didn't want an employer to know that that was my political stance, if I, was, if I needed a job in a sort of more nonpartisan, I've always been a lefty and I'm fine being a lefty and I know I always will be a lefty, so that's never been a filter for me. But for some people, it might be. Um, in fact, earlier in my career, I had an opportunity to work for the Parents Family, PFLAG, Parents Family and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And it was actually before I was out, but I had lots of friends who were gay. And I was like, oh, do I want this organization on my resume? Will it seem like I, I'm gay? Is that OK? Of course, I'm ashamed that I had to ask myself that. But that's what happens, right? And now, like, you know, you would know I was gay within three minutes of reading anything of mine, not just because I'm hawking this organization I care about, but I am also talking about advocacy and other issues related to it. You know, I'm very much more comfortable with who I am. Of course, that was the like 21-year-old me versus the 36-year-old me. So you know, life changes. But social media, I think, has pushed us to be a lot more authentic and real, and being comfortable with who we are. Hopefully. So, when was the last time you Googled yourself? Anybody Google themselves at any point? Have you ever looked yourself up on Google? All right. And of the, who's never looked themselves up on Google? All right, so, so most of you have. Who's looked yourself up at Google within the past two months? OK, good. So um, anybody ever find any surprising results when you Googled yourself? Something you didn't know was up there on the internet, or just positive or negative? Anything surprising? I found a mention in the New York Times. Whoa, that's a pretty impressive yeah, thing. It was, like really, it was just a light. It was pretty, you know. But you didn't even know it was there? No. Yeah. Wow. And so did you do anything? Did you comment on in the thread? Did you tell your friends and family? It did was you? related to my performing, which isn't what I do. I'm an activist. Uh -huh. So I didn't because I didn't care that much. <laughs> 
but it was something that you didn't know existed. Right, right. Anybody else find sort of a surprising thing, good, bad, neutral, when you Googled yourself? Political donations. Were Political donations come up pretty highly in the results. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that kind of surprised yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. The amount and everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, I have this sort of uh, fortune, and Bonnie's probably this way too, of there, there aren't too many Farrah Trumpeters out there. There may be other Bonnie McEwens. Quite a few. Um, I think I am the only Farrah Trumpeter that I know of. Um, so when you Google me, that's pretty much me. Um, whether it's, you know, you can see kind of in the, the top few results here are my bio page where I work, my page on LinkedIn, a lot of like profiles from conferences I, I've gone to, my Facebook page, um, presentations I've made. At the bottom of the screen, and we'll talk a little bit about this, are profile results. This is on Google. Google has profiles now. So one of the things that you should think about doing, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, is actually going in and creating your Google profile. And it gets associated. I actually have two. The one with the duck was my original Gmail address, which is Trumpshaker at Gmail when I was a little you know, fun. And then I, have, I also have Farrah Trumpeter just to sort of keep that as my full name. And then, so if you were to do google.com slash profile slash Farrah Trumpeter, you'd get my page, and we'll look at that. So it's worth, again, I'm going to spend some time claiming your name. This is a really fun tool, namechecchk.com, where you can type in your name, your first name, or your, your whole full name, um, and check and see if it's already taken on different websites. Um, on this tool, you can show it either by popularity or by or rank or just by alphabetical. So you can see I sorted this by rank. So Google, Facebook, YouTube come up front. So you can see Farrah Trumpeter is taken on Google and Facebook, but it's open on YouTube. So if I wanted to claim that as my username and my channel, I could do that. So you know, this is a long list of channels. You don't need your name on all of these. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Just think about the ones that are really important to who you are and what you do. So for example, if I was a performance artist, and you know, it's really important for people to see videos of, my, of what I do, I probably really want to think about YouTube and Vimeo and Blip and all these other video social media networks. But if, I, if, there's, if I've done nothing with video and I don't have a lot of video to share, that's probably less of a priority to worry about. So it's important to think about who you are and who your audiences are when you're really creating the strategy. Um, you can also buy your domain. I just, I just bought my name on Network Solutions. There's a lot of other places where you can buy website domains. I just find this to be one of the easiest. So I just bought farrahtrumpeter.com. Uh, I haven't done anything with it yet, but I bought it just in case there's somebody else out there who might try and steal it up, which is probably not going to happen, but you never know. So it can't hurt to own your name at the very least. And at some point, you could possibly use that, again, depending on who you are. If I was a freelancer and I wasn't working full time, I might want to use farrahtrumpeter.com as a way to put different parts of my work and what I do and my thoughts and my blog and all of that in one place. Um, listening tools. How many of you have, know what Google Alerts are? OK, and how many of you have the Google Alerts set up for your organization or issues you care about? Anybody have a Google Alert set up for their name? All right, I got a few here. So I have a Google Alert set up for my name, as well as something called TweetBeep, which is um, Twitter's uh, a version of Twitter Google Alert kind of meld. There's a few different ones out there. So um, anytime my name comes up in, in, on the web or on blogs, like if I was happened to be cited in the New York Times, which sadly has yet to happen, but one day a girl can dream. Um, I get these emails, this is from a, um, last month, I got an email saying when I showed up in Google, right? Now what's interesting, the first result is actually my status from Facebook. It says, it's a beautiful day, time to get some donuts, it gets cut off. Um, I was excited about that, it was like when spring was first started happening, for some reason we were walking and getting donuts. Um, and then also, you know, uh, there's just a link to somewhere I'm presenting, a comment that I made on someone else's Facebook page and it goes on. Um, then on Twitter, um, this is um, a conversation, this was from a conference I went to actually a year ago, where somebody gave me, there was a conference call talking about how I was mentioned on this best of the nonprofit technology network webinar. I had no idea this webinar was even happening or that I was mentioned, but now I could go to the people and be like, thanks for mentioning, glad you liked my presentation. And that's part of this building reputation is again, saying thank you is really important. Bonnie talked about sharing. Sharing is huge, as well as thanking people. And then passing, like, you were a great resource, too. Letting, you know, acknowledging that. Um, tweet, so tweet beep, if you're on Twitter, 
Um, I have it set for any time Farrah is mentioned, which is also how I knew that Farrah Fawcett passed away when she did. Um, so sometimes you get other things that are not just about you coming up. But you could also search just at and your name if you're on Twitter. That's your sort of comes before you when you're mentioned. Um, think before you post, WWGT. Anyone have a guess at what that stands for? No? What would grandma think? That's my grandma. That's Nana Jewel. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are like, well, I'm not sure what, about what I should do to mediate this content. You know, and um, my big thing is if you wouldn't say it in front of your mom or your grandma, maybe you shouldn't say it online, right? If you, if you don't want your mom or grandma or, or someone else, uh, or you wouldn't want the New York Times to know that you felt a certain way, maybe it shouldn't be your Facebook status update. Um, that might sound silly, but it's a good place to start, right? Of course, you want to filter it, again, by the messages you want to send out and your personality. But if it's not something you want the world to know, don't put it online, because it will be captured. Uh, there's a website out there. There's a few different ones like this. This is kind of crazy. This website, people, P-I-P-L dot com. Go there and put your name in. I'm, tr I'm not trying to scare you. It's good to be, you know, awareness is the first, the first thing. Um, on people.com, this is the first page of results, it's got addresses of mine, street addresses, it has background reports that you can access, I'm sure for a small fee, although I don't know who would want to, profiles on Friendster, classmates, uh, Facebook, it has um, when I went to college, it, it talks about various email addresses I've had. And what's interesting, in the, if you look at the pictures in the corner, those top two pictures on the right side, one is from my Friendster profile, one is from my MySpace, both of which I've recently deleted because I'm not using those tools anymore and most people aren't that I'm trying to build relationships with. But it's still online, right? It's still captured that image and, that, and, that, and that's showing up also on this page. So this page is like an archive of everything I've done online. It's a little bit creepy. Again. It's kind of crazy how much is out there on you, but the thing to keep in mind with all this privacy stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about that, most people aren't looking to steal your identity online as far as we know, but particularly those of you who are activists and you're putting yourself out there, you know, it's, it's important or your, your business maybe is in a certain type of business where the competition is high, it's a good thing to be aware of, these, of what's out there. Um, privacy settings. I want to speak for a second on Facebook, the ever-changing world of Facebook. Um, just as soon as you figure out Facebook and how they've designed the interface or how they use their settings, they change it. Um, and that's happened yet again. Last week was a big Facebook developer conference called the F8. Um, Beth Cantor, who's an awesome blogger about nonprofits and social media, posted something today about what you and nonprofits need to know about Facebook and, and the recent settings. Um, people are still trying to wrap their heads around it because it just came out. And right now, most of the people talking about it are developer geeks. Um, so the rest of us communications types are still trying to get our head around it. But if you haven't checked, and even if you have, you should go back and recheck because they keep changing your privacy settings. So there are two places you might want to start by looking. Um, right under that sort of account drop down in the corner of your screen uh, when you're on Facebook in the top right corner, you can pull down and there's a privacy settings tab. I have the URL on here. But you can go in and check you know, who gets to see my likes and interests, who gets to see my photos and videos of me, who gets to see posts that I put up or posts that I put on friends wall. And you can set only friends of friends, my friends, everyone in the world. right? And you can change who gets to see what about you. Now part of the newer thing about what's happening with Facebook is this whole the switch from become a fan to like. Are you all familiar with that switch? Right, so it used to be that you can, I hate it too. It used to be you can become a fan of an organization's page. And people have started to understand that. Well, now you like everything. Just like you like someone's status, you now like pages. And now, and now Facebook has its relationships with sites like Yelp um, and Pandora where if I'm on Pandora and I like a song, it, and Bonnie's on Pandora, it might be like, hey, Bonnie, Farrah likes this song. You might like it too, just like the Amazon model, right? So all of this stuff is being collected about us. And you can choose whether or not you want that information as much as possible out there. So under the, new app, under the Applications tab in Privacy, there are two settings you might want to look at, what your friends can share about you, and then this instant personalization, that's this bottom one, that's the newest one. You can go in and uncheck it. If you don't want your information on Yelp and Pandora and all these other things, um, you can go in and change that. 
So again, if you're not sure where you are, check your privacy settings and really think about how much information you want out there with the world. Um, measurement, Bonnie spoke a little bit about this. Uh, there's a great post on boosting your personal brand in the Social Media Examiner, another good blog. Um, and I just wanted to pull out some metrics that they highlighted. When you're thinking about how to measure, you know, start by doing an audit. This is all Communications 101. If you've taken any of Bonnie's classes, you've heard this before. Before you ever want to make change in, in communicating, changing how an organization communicates or how you communicate, you want to get a baseline of what's working by taking an audit. So the first thing you want to start out with, start right now, write it, you know, create a, a grid for yourself. If you're on, you know, take the tools that you're on, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, you know, my LinkedIn, whatever, and take a note of how many followers or friends you have, who's subscribing to your blog or your friend feed or whatever tools you're using. Look at how many people are retweeting your information, clicking on stuff you put out there, sharing it, commenting, discussing, and really not just looking at your information, but engaging with it. How many people are writing recommendations for you, or how many referrals have you made? Right, taking a look at all of that now, and then keeping a track of these things on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, as you really are trying to measure how wide your social capital is. So I want to talk briefly a, a little bit about my social media, and then we'll, we'll pause for some Q&A. Um, on Big Duck's page, so there, there's certain elements about your brand you can control, right? You can control on your organization's website, if you work for a nonprofit or a company, you can control what your picture is, um, what your, you know, what information goes up there about you. Now, uh, for the company I work for, we have sort of a fun way of doing bios where it's sort of more of a Q&A. You know, why do I work here? What, what I think is just ducky? What ruffles my feathers? Um, life before big duck, right? So we, we sort of talk about our bios in that way. And you could read that I like uh, my cat, internet movie database. I'm sort of obsessed with that site. Um, and that I can't stand paying for internet. You know, you can find out these fun stuff. Um, now, I also blog through my company, through Big Duck. And on Big Duck's blog, you can see all the posts that I've written. And these are a these, you know, summary of my posts, right? And they're things about nonprofits and mobile communications or things that I heard at a great technology conference I went to. And again, this part's what I'm writing about on blogs, you know, helps shape the ideas associated with me as does the comments I make on other people's blogs. And again, it's important not just to put your own information out there, but to comment and engage with what other people are putting out there in the field that you want to be established in. Now, I also, to the point of being, you know, having a little fun and, and being yourself, I also did write a blog post um, as part of our New Year's card. Big Duck sent out an email to all of our list with gifts from the staff. There were recipes, restaurants you should go to, I posted a video of me breakdancing in our fifth grade talent show. It's a little Michael Jackson homage. It's quite entertaining. Um, this is one of the only videos with my name on it on YouTube, actually. Um, so I, you know, it's 20 seconds long, but it was fun. And people got to know a different side of me, my clients, my colleagues, that, you know, and this is still part of who I am. Um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really, I think if you're trying to figure out this whole thing, LinkedIn is the first place you should start if you're thinking about how you use social media for any kind of professional advancement. LinkedIn also, you know, over the, I've been on LinkedIn pretty much since it started and it has changed a lot. It is really trying to keep up with the Joneses. You can share information now, you can put a status on LinkedIn and you can send that to Twitter. You can embed, as I've embedded, presentations I've done. My blog goes through my LinkedIn profile. Right? There's a lot you can do with LinkedIn now. It's, it's definitely evolved. Um, and it's a really, LinkedIn used to, I used to describe it as the MySpace you know, for professionals. Clearly, that reference is a little outdated now, um, <clears throat> since Facebook's mostly taken over the MySpace field. But it's become your online resume. So when you go to, to LinkedIn, you can see all the places I've worked for. Um, and you can see actually the first viewers of this profile also viewed Bonnie's. We're very connected, Bonnie and I, online and offline. Um, you can see who I've recommended, but also who's recommended me, right? So I have actually had people just sort of put lovely recommendations on my wall, but I've also solicited them. I've also said, you know, I worked with you. I think we had a great, you know, would you be interested in writing a recommendation for me on LinkedIn? You know, and you want to think selectively about this. You want to think about who you ask. You don't want to, you know, people that you think 
obviously are going to, you know, write things that are pretty real and believable, but also people that in many times you'd be willing to write a recommendation for as well, because there's a bit of a quid pro quo. Now with LinkedIn, you can, you can set your settings to only display certain recommendations you've made on your profile so that you can sort of really show who you're highlighting as sort of the, the top. Has anybody asked for people for recommendations on LinkedIn? Great. Um, so more of you should do that. Because more and more now, when people are looking at resumes, and Bonnie and I get resumes for where we work, we will Google you, right? We will look for you on LinkedIn. And we will see, like, do you have, especially if you're looking for a job in social media or network building, if you have no friends on LinkedIn and you haven't built your LinkedIn profile out, it's a little scary, right? It doesn't give me a lot of confidence. Uh, Bonnie touched on the idea of resource sharing. LinkedIn also has something that sort of moved a little bit below the fold now that it's evolving, but they have a question and answers portal. So you can post questions. Um, these were some I posted in the past. You know, what were the best and brightest fundraising appeals of 2008? This was for an article that I was writing. And I asked people out there, and they, they write answers, and then I could rate who has the best answer. I've also answered questions. Someone wrote, should we require website visitors to enter contact information to receive case studies? And I wrote a response. Right? And the things that I choose to respond to help build that sort of sense of being a thought leader as one of my goals. Again, if your goal is less about getting a job or getting clients or really building a professional part of your personal brand, this may not be a place that you need to focus on, but most of us in this room probably are worried about this at some level or should be. Um, the other thing about LinkedIn, you know, I got a client through LinkedIn recently. It's actually someone who I met in person at a conference two years ago. We kept in touch over, after I met her at a conference. I asked her to be my friend on LinkedIn. And in January, she sent me this email saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you about the possibility of working with Big Duck. We're thinking about really you know, analyzing how we communicate. You know, feel free to give me a call and let's discuss. That came in through LinkedIn. That's not, you know, I was like, wow, that's awesome. That's the first time, honestly, that's ever happened in the years I've been on LinkedIn. But it does happen. Now, the more common thing that happens for me is requests for introductions. The way LinkedIn works is that if I'm connected to Bonnie and Bonnie's connected to Sonia, but I'm not yet connected to Sonia, I can see her through that sort of three degrees of separation. Right? So, that, so LinkedIn sort of does that six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing for us professionally. Um, so here, someone that I work with, a friend of hers, wanted to connect to somebody I knew. So, her friend Chris, Liz is someone I work with, was contacting me to talk to this woman, Sujatha, that I know, asking, would you introduce, they'd like to have sort of a, you know, an info interview. And I did, and, they, and this woman was like, oh, sure, I'll talk to this person if they're a friend of yours. Again, you have to think selectively about, you don't want to just throw introductions to people you don't have any, you know, I trust Liz, so therefore I trust that her, rec if she's asking me to do something, this sounds like an interesting person. I also have said to people, when I do info interviews, become my friend on LinkedIn, look through my contacts, and let me know who you want me to introduce you to. I get rarely taken up on that. And I think it's something you should really think about. If you ever do an info interview with somebody, and they, you know, connect with them on LinkedIn, if they're connected to other people you know, that's the whole point of this. This stuff is now online. It's so much easier. Bonnie can't remember everybody she knows in her Rolodex, but if you look at who she's on LinkedIn, if she knows somebody who's connected to a place you want to work for, she might be more likely to connect you because you can remind her, hey, but you know, you know Jane Doe, I know you haven't talked to her in a few years, but would you mind reconnecting with her on my behalf? Facebook, briefly. So to the point of using the same profile image, I usually do. <laughs> um, about a month or two ago, this was my Facebook profile. This is what I would look like bald, apparently. Not so pretty. Um, I, one of my clients is the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and we were doing a campaign for them called Totally Baldacious, Shave One for the Team. And the idea was that people would raise money, and if they hit their goal, they would shave their head or color their hair, which I did. If you can see the red, yes, apparently not baldacious enough for Bonnie. Um, and you could do that in solidarity of people with cancer. Um, so you could also virtually bald yourself and see what you look like. So this is what I look like. But just you know, briefly on Facebook, you can see that you know my what I my status updates are most are a blend of personal and professional, right? Because I'm connected to a blend of personal and professional people. So when I just did my birthday wish campaign, which is a causes application on Facebook, I got gifts from my friends, but I also got it from people I work with that I've never even met. 
that just you know support me and, and believe in the causes that I, same causes. So they made a donation. So Facebook, I think, has most people think of it as just personal, but again, depending on who you are, it has become evolving. I often get the question: Should I have two different profiles? Should I have you know, Farrah Trumpeter Big Duck as my name and just Farrah Trumpeter for my real friends? I generally believe no. You should have one profile. You can use your privacy settings to put people in groups and choose what they want to see, but you are who you are. So I think you should have one presence. I'm going to speed this up a little. Um, Twitter. So, so Twitter, Bonnie mentioned this as well. You know, Twitter, you've got a little room to put a bio. Think about the words that go there. My bio says nonprofit communication strategist, VP at Big Duck. So I'm, notice, I'm noting you know, where I work, but also that Big Duck's on Twitter. Right, so you can see that connection. But I didn't just put my title. I put nonprofit communication strategist. That's not my official title, but that's who I am. Right? Those are the three words I'd want you to associate with me. Um, and I also, the background of my Twitter page is my company brand. But I used Farah because I was excited to get Farah as my name, um, here on Twitter. So you'll notice as we go through, you'll see both my, my profile names are either Farah or Farah Trumpeter, depending on the site. Twitter especially, you want something shorter because you've got these limits of characters. Um, but it's just something to think about. And when I use Twitter, I do it everything from sharing information I know, responding to conversations, trying to put information out there, and every now and then promoting work that my company's doing. SlideShare. Anybody know this website, slideshare.net? SlideShare is a really cool website. It's where basically people can post their presentations. It's a great place to look for material on information. But you also, if you're someone who speaks, it's a place you can put your presentations and people can see what else you've talked about. And you can see people start favoriting your presentations or downloading them or giving comments. And again, it's a way, if, if, be, if you're someone who speaks a lot or if your organization does presentations, this is a good thing to have a, and, and it's coming up, it ranks highly in Google too, if you have it. So I mentioned Google profiles before. This is my profile at Farrah Trumpeter. So I can set links, I've linked to, the website I work for and my LinkedIn page. As you can see where I live. Um, and you can fill in, they, they just ask you questions. Where did you grow up? Who have you worked for? What schools have you attended? Um, et cetera. Superpower, my superpower is connecting. I've tried to explain, you know, I love the LinkedIn. Um, so this is, you can, you can set what you want to be up there, but it's worth claiming that profile. On, and if you go to, you know, google.com slash profiles, it'll walk you through it. Um, finally, this is a relatively newer site. I don't know how popular this is going to be, but I just started playing around with it. Flavors.me, where again, you can add links to your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your Twitter, and then anything else. I've also added the Big Duck blog, and then I've put my bio up there. So there are a lot of like emerging tools on this, and I think for many of them, it's fun to just experiment, but you should start by the real pop the popular ones. Um, and last but not least, there's email. Remember that thing? Sort of old school now with online. In my email, in my signature, everyone know what a signature is in an email, right? That's the sort of pre, you can preset the information that goes in the bottom of every message. You can see I have the address, my cell phone, my work phone, but then I have my Twitter handle, my AOL handle, my Skype, and a link to my LinkedIn and Facebook pages. Because I'm fine with my clients connecting with me in those, pla in those ways. M not everyone might be. So you have to determine what you're okay with, but make it easy for people to find you. I shouldn't have to, if I can't find you right away on LinkedIn, make it as easy as possible. So I just want to leave with the idea of a sort of strategy. How do you sort of put your, your head around all of this? Well, first of all, be yourself. Know who you are and what your voice is and what makes you unique. And be really clear about that and let that guide every decision you make. Develop goals, right? What, what do you want to get out of your presence on social media? And use that to pick what you're going to do, what, what channels you spend a lot more time in than not. If you're not sure and, you know, what to do, listen and learn from your peers. Learn from people who are doing it right that you know. People that you wish you could be like. Everyone has someone they admire. See what they're doing online. But also listen to see when you're mentioned so that you can respond to those conversations. Um, selecting tools based on the goals in your audience. So there was a question about people with disabilities. You know, if there are, there are certain sites that are, are more accessible than others because um, the way they're set up. And so maybe using something like Skype, which is more of a tool, might be interesting because you can do video and audio and people can communicate with you. 
But if you're worried about reaching people with disabilities, they're reading the internet with screen readers, particularly people who have visual disabilities. So how you, you know, put a tag on an image or even what you write in your status update, instead of using cute little jargon or like TXT for text or PPL for people, spelling out words, right? So really thinking about not only what tools you use, but how you use them based on the audience you're trying to communicate with. Privacy settings, we've talked about that. Um, making it easy for people to find you, right? Putting all that information on your, you know, we're about to update Big Duck's business cards and we're gonna put our Twitter and LinkedIn profiles on there because we're using those tools very actively. If you work for an organization, um, keep in mind that actually everyone is a spokesperson. Um, you know, traditional PR and media it used to just be the executive director, the board chair, maybe the director of communications. These people are the spokesperson for your organization. Now, the people who are actually updating the Twitter and the Facebook, especially if their names are associated with, are becoming your spokespeople. So you might want to remind everybody what would grandma think, but also create guidelines. And there's lots of tools about social media guidelines. Uh, make sure to measure your impact and keep listening and refine. And then finally, have fun. So um, I have some resources. Again, these are lots of this. You can get the presentation. And there's lots of great articles on reputation management, how to brand yourself in social media. Um, I've Actually, the last link is a link to that Beth Cantor article about Facebook changes. So you can, you can get all of this stuff. Um, I'll put this resources slide back up in a second. Love to stay in touch. Um, there's all sorts of ways you can find me. Of course, again, there's, there's the good old fashioned email, but you can also find me on Twitter and Facebook and all sorts of other good places. Um, and if you want a copy of our slides, uh, this is actually not my cat or Bonnie's cat. It could be though. It's a cat I found on Flickr. Um, if you want a copy of our slides, they're posted on the site drop.io slash Milano personal branding. Um, and you can get the PDF of both my slides and Bonnie's slides there. So with that, um, I'll leave this up for a second and then go back to the resources page and then we'll take questions. The time that I spend on it varies. Um, in the beginning when I was setting up profiles, like Farah's mentioned a couple things that I haven't done, like that slide share thing. I now see I'm going to have to go set up my profile in SlideShare, especially because I just heard that it comes up in Google really well. Because most of the times you're going to get clients through either a direct referral, and they're going to come to your site or your blog or whatever to check you out to make sure that you are legitimate or are as important as the referral said you were. Or they're going to come to you through an organic Google search. So anything that's going to up me in Google, I need to do. So that means I've got to now devote some time to this uh, slideshare.net thing. Um, so in the next week or so, I'll probably have to spend maybe the equivalent of a day uh, doing that, which for me, a day is seven hours. Um, but uh, you know, I can spend lots and lots of time. And in the beginning, I was all over the place. And so I finally decided that the places that, because it's my, I'm in a business to business communication, right? So the places I'm most likely to find people are going to be through LinkedIn and now Twitter. Twitter is really huge and easy to use and doesn't take that much time. And uh, I also actually recommend a lot of um, articles on the New York Times site. They have this thing where people can now follow you on some of these different news sites. So I always make sure that I recommend a couple of articles every day on that New York Times site so that I only have like 21 people who follow me, but I don't even know who they are, which is kind of interesting. And then um, I uh, am also a uh, top reviewer on Amazon. So in order to maintain that number, because I, I have to stay above 1,000. So I'm seven, I don't know, 760 or something this morning. So I have to make sure that I do a book review or a product review or something at least once a week. You know? So I kind of now have it down. But in the beginning, I think it takes lo a lot longer to set you up. And then um, you have to sometimes discipline yourself to to spend an adequate amount of time to maintain once you get to a certain point. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have I have a rule that every single day 
I recommend a couple of articles in the New York Times. Um, every day I, def I tweet at least three or four times a day at different points because different people follow you at different times. And I always uh, post something on Facebook and I don't always update my status, but I often do. And I, I try to link my status into news events, right? To have some comment on the news event, you know, or something like that. So it takes me a couple of hours every morning. I'd say most people seem to be probably spending two hours throughout the day. But the thing to think about with social media is it's not nine to five. And um, if you're really assertively using it, it spills certainly beyond the nine to five. So there may be, you know, if somebody mentions you on Twitter at 8 p.m. and you don't respond to them until, you know, 10 a.m. the next day, it feels like it's really, it's really lacking. There's the sort of response times connected to certain social media channels are vary. And I think if you're worried about like how actively you can get into social media, you wouldn't want to start with Twitter. Because Twitter can be, is very like, there's a lot happening and there's rapid information and you need to respond and connect and whatever. You know, other channels like LinkedIn is much more, is, is a lot less interactive right away. It can be more interactive as you get into it. So I think it really goes back to your goals, your audiences, and then your resources. What time do you have available to jump into this? Right, and starting to test it out um, and see, like there are people who blog, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs every day. And I'm like, where do they have time to do this? Don't they have jobs to do? Um, so I only blog, you know, once or twice a month. I wish I wrote, you know, more frequently, but I can't. I do other things more frequently. So you have to see what's right for you in your schedule, but also thinking about your audiences. If your audiences are online and they're looking for you there, you need to be there. So you have to see, it sort of just becomes another place uh, where you communicate, just like sending emails, answering the phone, et cetera. There's some other questions, yeah. Well, let me take a crack sure. at um, I, I want to say, uh, kind of going back to this idea of how much time, that's why this Tweeple and Google alerts are super important, especially Tweeple, because that way you don't have to monitor these things every second of every day. You just keep check, you check in and Tweeple tells you via email if somebody mentioned your name, and then that way you can you know, be you know, Bonnie on the spot and respond and say thank you or whatever. Um, I think it depends um, on you know what you're in terms of what you post. I always do a really thoughtful post, in as I said in the mornings, and then I might I might do something you know later on. But if I'm going to do something kind of off the cuff, usually what I do then is I will retweet some some something somebody else sent, and I'll just put a comment on there. I don't like retweets that don't add anything. So I will usually say, you know, uh, good article for, good article on advocacy. And then I might retweet it or something like that. That's how I do the more casual thing. As far as a salary, that's really interesting because I think it's all over the lot. Mm -hmm. I actually saw a couple of ads just today. If you go on idealist.org, you'll see, um, you know, I think generally nonprofits at least aren't really paying the salaries that they ought to for digital people. Um, and I don't know about, you know, I don't follow corporations. And I saw some consulting firms I thought were really on the low side for the amount of expertise and the, the uh, demand, the requirement that you stay very current, right? But um, I think if uh, certainly, you know, 50,000 would be pretty good. But I've seen some that are really lame. I saw like thirty-eight thousand or something somebody wanted, and I wouldn't take that job because I think you can get you can get a better. I know you're laughing, right? But um, yeah, I think. But it, unless, well, if you're a really dedicated person and this is your cause, yeah, you know, I have a, a former student who isn't David, who's somebody else, um, but he really, really only wants to work for a certain kind of organization, and so the salary doesn't quite mean that much to him. But then I also have another former student from long ago who's well into her career and who's really got a tremendous amount of expertise. And uh, you know, somebody's trying to hire her for $80,000 and I keep telling her don't take that job because I don't think that you can find anybody who's really, really savvy at her level for that kind of money, so. 
just yeah. depends. I, I'm not sure that any guidelines have been published yet on salary for social media, but the places I would look, one is Idealware, I-D-E-A-L-W-A-R-E.org. Sort of like a consumer reports for nonprofits. They put out stuff on, you know, which email list building tools are better. They're doing a social media survey right now. That may be a question. Idealware, I-D-E-A-L-W-A-R-E.org. The other is the Nonprofit Technology Network, N10, N-T-E-N.org. They just put out an IT salary survey as well as a social network, nonprofits and social network survey. I'm not sure if they got into that level of salaries and such. I can double check if you want to email me. Um, I don't think it was listed. I think it's a newer thing. Um, but what I will say is I'm definitely seeing more and more jobs talking about manage our online presence and particularly, you know, write for our blog, update our Facebook, you know, manage our Twitter. Um, to your other question just about updating from your iPhone, it really depends on, you know, I do do some updates from my iPhone. I was live tweeted. I live tweeted something Bonnie said, uh, you know, a half hour ago. You know, I, I was able to sort of think in 140 characters here in this room to do that. It really depends on what you're comfortable with and, and what the message is. But I think if, it, if you really are still trying to get your, you know, grounded and not sure how much you want to put out there, maybe it does need a place where you're really sitting and focusing and, and doing that from your phone may not be it. So it really depends on what your comfort level is. Again, it's just a tool. Sonia knows I always say this. It's, not, it's a tool, not the strategy. What's important first is your strategy, and then the tools will, you know, what, what makes sense fits in. You're not the only one that feels that way, and that's where setting your privacy settings are really important. And also, if you don't want people to know about it, then don't do it, right? You control the information at a certain level. You control the information out there. If you're not sure that you want people to know that you signed this sort of anti-immigration thing, don't sign it. Well, that's why I think you need to think about, I mean, just what you're doing right now. You need to think about where do I want to be in five or ten years? What does that job description look like? What does that company look like? Not an actual name, but like it's the kind of company that does X, Y, and Z. My job is PDQ. And then think about what you need to do to get there. Social media is one part, obviously, of what you need to do. Networking, building relationships offline, the jobs, the skills you have. Like if you want to be a director of communications, because right now you're the you know, manager, you know, what, it, what skills does that person have that you need to jump up? Social media is the same way. If you want to work for a communications firm, using communication tools effectively is important. If that's not what you want to do, so it, there's all sort of nuances around this. It's really, unfortunately, not black and white. Right. Well, I guess you could show what you've done for your clients. Right. right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, think, I think you're better off just having a you know, keep, have a minimal presence at least, you know, like show what you do for your clients mm -hmm. or something. Um, but, but I also just want to put this out there, which is a little, a little bit sort of straying off the topic in a sense, but I think one of the great things about social media is, is it pushes us to, to more fully integrate our personal and our, our work lives, you know? Like this whole idea of work-family balance or work-life balance. I mean, if you talk about work-life balance, what you're really saying is that when you're at work, you're dead, right? I mean, work isn't part of your life. And, you know, that's, that's not necessarily the best thing for anybody. So I, I think if you could think about the kind of job that you really want, you know, rather than thinking, oh, I might really need to take some job and then I have to be somebody I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, and I realize that's, you know, easier said than done, especially when you're earlier in your career. But um, I would just urge you to think about that. I mean, I think it really goes back to your overall brand personality, like who you are as an organization, and then distilling that into sort of online and how you want to be. So we have a Twitter at Big Duck, right? But I tweet at Farah, my boss tweets at Big Duck, Sarah, another one of my colleagues tweets at Elizabeth Ricca. We tweet our own things, sometimes we, we retweet what the company says, sometimes the company retweets us, right? But we haven't, and we're starting to think about, there's our marketing coordinator is the main person who writes those tweets, but you wouldn't know that. We want to put her name on that, so you know who's the sort of Wizard of Oz, you know, who's the man behind the curtain. You know, more and more there's a move toward transparency right now. There's some great, uh, one of the best nonprofits, I and mean, we could, 
This is mostly what Bonnie and I talk about when we're not doing personal, we're talking about how organizations use this stuff. We can do that another day. Um, but there's a great, um, one of the best nonprofits that does this is the National Wildlife Federation. Um, in fact, if you let me know, and we can see what kind of room where, you know, our room's not that much bigger, is, is much smaller than this. On Thursday night in our online engagement class, we have uh, at least three nonprofit experts coming in talking about that work at nonprofits, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, National Wildlife Federation, and Witness. Staff from those organizations are coming in to talk about how they manage the social media for their nonprofits. And you can ask them those, you know, Danielle, who's coming in, she tweets at Star Focus. She's like a big nonprofit Twitter rock star. You should follow her. She does her own thing, but when you go to the National Wildlife Federation website, they list like the 70 different Twitter handles of all their staff that tweets and how it connects to the main organization, and they do a great job of connecting it. So this, again, this stuff is still new, but there is generally a move toward being transparent and knowing who's that person who's sending those messages out, or if there are a lot of people. Um, yes. That said, I don't think you should automatically throw every status update you do from LinkedIn to Twitter, from Twitter to Facebook, from Facebook to LinkedIn. I think sometimes there are things that are very unique to the sort of language and etiquette of that website. You know, I have friends who are on Facebook who are not on Twitter, and they'll say to me, I don't understand. I get these Facebook updates with these at signs and these pound things. I have no idea what they mean because mm -hmm. they're not on Twitter, right? They don't understand the sort of Twitterese or the, you know, that happens. So you have to think about the way you write something for LinkedIn might not make sense in a 140 character way on, on Twitter. So I think that part, the sort of automatic status, I, I think about, you know, check when it's appropriate. But in terms, you know, depending on how you use these tools, when you go to my LinkedIn page, you can see my slides and SlideShare. You can see my blog posts from WordPress, right? They're being pulled in just on my one profile page because that's part of, of my professional and personal brand. You may not want your, maybe you blog about your hobby, maybe you're a bird watcher and you blog about that. That's not as important to who you are in terms of representing yourself personally, professionally, so you don't bring it in. So it really all depends on the content. You know, I don't know if we've used the C word, but content is very important at the end of the day in all of this stuff. So the question is around using hashtags and Twitter and managing that. You know, hashtags are basically, you know, the pound sign with a term, when you put that in a tweet, if you click on that, you can see all other tweets related to that same topic that people have identified to put it in. So if I write, you know, talking about personal branding, I could put a hashtag before branding. And then every other, you know, tweet, which is a message on Twitter that shows up on branding would show up in a thread. Um, I think it really, again, depends on the content and who your audiences are. I use hashtags. To, like when I was at this nonprofit technology conference, everyone who was tweeting from there was trying to connect in the conversation, so we were all using pound 10 NTC, which was the hashtag for that conference. And now you can go back and see all the conversations related to that. But TweetDeck is a great tool. Um, you can also just, you know, you, there's something called Twas Up, which I love, I just found out. I just like to say it. T-W-A-Z-Z-U-P dot com. It's a sort of archive search of Twitter. So there's a lot of different, you know, it really depends if the people you're following and who you want to follow you are using them also. Bye, also, uh, well, the, um, the student here, Melissa Holmes, who works with me on promoting the school, likes uh, something called Hoot Suite, mm -hmm. and um, that's uh, linked into the Owly uh, URL shortener, and it also has a track back, so that you can tell if you it'll give you a unique URL, and then anybody who clicks on your tweet or your you know that URL, it'll tally it and tell you. Same with Bitly. I use Bitly mm -hmm. all the time for the same thing. So you can. And, and I like Seismic Desktop. There's something called Yeah, Seismic there's Desktop. lots of Twitter They'll clients. They'll track all of that stuff. Like Seismic has one column for Facebook, one for Twitter, one for LinkedIn. So I, it's all like a dashboard with all of my three big social media sites, all that stuff. And then you can categorize your hashtags and all your other stuff. Well. Ironically, the last podcast that Big Duck recorded was an interview with Bonnie about a year ago, and we still have thousands of people subscribing and listening to our podcast. Mm -hmm. So a podcast, does everyone know what a podcast is, right? So for a long time, you've been able to put files 
you know, an MP3 file on the internet and people could listen to it. In about 2004, they created a technology where you could subscribe and get updates to the MP3. And <coughs> iTunes is the most popular way to do it, but there are other ways that you can listen to podcasts. So people use podcasts to sort of, we could have audio recorded today's conversation and stream that as a podcast, or you can make episodes. Um, you don't hear about podcasts as much now as you did when they first came out, 2004, 2005, 2006. That said, again, depending on your content and your audience, I know it sounds like a broken record, podcasts are still well used by a lot of organizations. So it really depends if your audience is there and you have the right kind of content that lends itself to podcasting, that makes sense. If your content's much more visual or the audience you're trying to reach is hearing impaired, but they can see something visually with captions, then using video is going to be more important than podcasting. But podcasting, or you can also video podcast too. So. But podcasting also, though, is easier and simpler mm -hmm. for the same reason that if you use video, you've got to come up with a visual. Mm -hmm. But if you are using podcasting, uh, people can download it really easily and take it with them. And you can really talk about all kinds of ideas that you don't have to illustrate. And that's why I like podcasts still. There's another great website called pewinternet.org. It's the Pew Internet and American Life Project. They publish stats galore for anyone who likes stats, like I do. Um, so you can find out who's the latest, so who listens to podcasts, how, you know, how much of that is an internet behavior as compared to watching videos or whatever else. So again, it's always worth checking to see, you know, I can say, well, I don't listen to podcasts anymore, so it must be dead. But I'm not your audience, or I'm not the only member of your audience. So it's really important to go look at the data and see what it's telling you for the general public. And then you could always do a survey or interview your audience and say, do you listen to podcasts? Would you listen to our executive director talking for 10 minutes once a month? Would that be interesting to you? Or whatever you might podcast about. Uh, the other thing, I, I heard this great thing just this morning. Um, and I can't think where I was spinning the dial and I heard this somewhere. Um, but new technology there we always make the assumption that a new technology crowds out the old mm -hmm. but in fact that isn't what happens almost always old technologies are still you know they remain useful for certain purposes and the best example um, i can think of is um, in a class i'm uh, talking with working with now we talk a lot about community media you know <laughs> lo very local hyper local media and a lot of the community media is still driven by radio and if you're in certain parts of the world, people aren't going to be able to watch video, you know? Uh, so a podcast might even be pretty high tech. Um, it, but it, it just depends. But I do think there are lots of people who maybe can't watch videos that easily mm -hmm. because they're not portable, whereas a podcast is. So I agree that it really depends on the audience. Use different names, yeah. sure. Yeah. Different names, different images, and there is an art. There was an article that I didn't put in here, but I have it. If you want to email me about managing multiple identities, it's not something that I often advocate or have had to deal with. Um, but if you want, I can send you that article about it. But I think, yeah, obviously using different names, different images, different main websites that it connects to, and you could do that. What did you say? It would be a yeoman's job. Right. Yeah, that's just doubling the amount of work you have for yourself. Yeah. Right. Like but seven emails at the same time. Yeah, except for in that case, I would definitely use something like a seismic desktop or something so you can stream those side by side so that you can see them both at the same time. Like there's, a, there's another Bonnie McEwen on Facebook. And I know. But, but it's really kind of interesting because I started getting all these... Um, Friend, I, I can't remember. I guess I, I logged on and it said log in again or something. Anyway, somehow I ended up on getting this other person's profile <laughs> or get, at least getting into um, email or something. So I get all these friend requests from people that I haven't heard from in eons, and some of them I'd already friended. And I, it, so it, I was puzzled, and it, I finally figured out that the, somehow the Facebook got the two profiles confused. So I think that you know, you'd have to be really careful to try to really build a wall and make sure that you use really different names and definitely different images and things like that. Anybody out there actually managing two different personalities online? Yes, let's talk about yeah. Um, it's not so much that it's not either of me. It's just like you were saying where if 
I say I'm happy today or I woke up today, the people that I follow that may be from work or all, they don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. Whereas I post mm -hmm. articles and things like that from a, where it's my, both of them are my name actually. Um, one is sort of a handle or a nickname and the other, but both of them have my real name in them. It's just the content the people that I follow on each side. And is that just on yeah. Facebook or in other on channels? Twitter. On Twitter. On, on yeah. Facebook, it would be way too much to yeah. manage. Yeah. Because I have like 600 people right. there. Right. And to try to keep that separate. But Twitter is mm -hmm. really easy yeah. to do. Yeah. I have I know other people who um, Twitter I think probably you're right is easier to do that. I know people who tweet like at their name related to their work stuff and anything that's kind of related to that. But then if they're into like I have a friend who's into crafting and so then they have like a handle that's more like crafty NYC and that's their stuff about like all things crafts and blogs they're reading and cool patterns and whatever else. So there are so Twitter is a lot and you're right because there are separate audiences who might be interested in certain things. Facebook is a little bit blurrier. Mm -hmm. right. Good morning. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. for articles or that's what I'm looking for from those mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why I think these settings in Facebook are really important. So you, because you have to be remember that anything you put on there, unless you choose who gets to see what, you can be junking up somebody's timeline, and they right. are not going to appreciate it. You know, you no, got I'm Hangman Games right. or something. Games, yeah, really. right. And then Mafia um, Wars Farmville. I don't get it. Oh, <laughs> please. You know? And then the other, uh, the other thing though that's really useful is uh, like recently, my high school graduating class had a reunion. So everybody's coming out of the woodwork on classmates, right? And I get all these people who friend me on Facebook. And I definitely, I mean, I can't remember half of these people, right? But I'm not going to not friend them, so yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> but I got them in a separate list on Facebook, and they see certain things. Because, you know, I'm just not going, and it's not so much that I, I'm worried about what, but I don't want to have to, I don't care what they think frankly, about what I'm, you know, what I'm posting. So it's just easier to put them in some ghetto over here. <laughs> right, that's the whole privacy settings. Yeah. Um, the other thing I do want to say, though, in thinking about your status updates, you should think about who's following you. Um, for example, I've mentioned um, there's another organization that I'm on an advisory committee for. Um, and I recently saw a staff member post this message like, Great weekend. Ugh, have to go back to work. These people are crazy, and I'm like, uh, uh oh, <laughs> you know. And similarly, I have a client that I've seen. Like every time I log on Facebook, they're playing Mafia Wars, and I'm just like, do you do any work? Um, I don't care. I'm your consultant, but your boss might be on here. Um, so it's important to think about a little bit about again your settings and who you know. Maybe when you play Mafia Wars, you don't want the world to know, so you can change the application setting on that. I don't know. I never played that game, but it seems like every time I log on, somebody's playing. Or Farmville. Farm. I don't get this thing. Yeah. So I actually have a practice that I do because I, you know, for my clients, okay? So anybody who's a current client has priority in getting a response, right? And some, some really, really close friends, you know, but um, mostly it's any current client. Then next priority is any former client who might once again become current, right? <laughs> and so I kind of have a little hierarchy and I do look and see and, um, but I don't, I don't feel like I have to respond every time. I, generally speaking, I do have a policy that my clients, all my clients hear from me in some way at least twice a week. And it might just be, uh, hi, I thought you'd like this article, you know, or it might be responding, saw you did XYZ, great publication, or saw you updated your website, really liked the blog, or something like that. You know, so it's the same thing, you just, just have priorities. Yeah, I mean, I think on a lot of this, it's sort of at least once a day. You're sort of checking in and seeing what's happening. And then depending on how frequent the communication's coming at you, you want to sort of, you might move it to twice a day. Then it might become three times a day. It really, like I, there's some people out there who say you should check your email three times a day. And that's, I can't imagine doing that. I check my email every 15 minutes, if not more frequently. And I feel like when somebody emails me, I have to, I try to write back, if not that day, within the next day. Otherwise, people get antsy. Again, so certain tools like Twitter, if somebody sends you a question on Twitter or mentions you, they sort of expect a response pretty quickly. 
Um, Facebook is a little bit slower. Email maybe is a little slower than that, but it really depends on the tool that you're in. If somebody sends you a request to connect on LinkedIn, I generally try and respond to that within a day or two. I've had people accept invitations I didn't even remember inviting. Mm -hmm. You know, like six months later, I was like, oh, right, I met you at that thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it just sort of doesn't, it makes it seem like, oh, I guess they don't really use this site and it's not, they're not as actively engaged in it. So you just also have to think about the message you're sending, um, but also how much is coming at you right now and how much you want to come at you. I recently saw somebody took themselves off Twitter because it was too much for them and they couldn't manage it well. So they were like, let me just focus on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and email and have that be my primary modes and not going on Twitter. It really depends on what you can manage and what you have time to do. Good question, good question. Um, you know, that's a very interesting question and I'm not sure I really thought of it so much that way, but um, my initial reaction would be somehow if you've got 13,000 followers on Twitter, I would say that's good. But somebody who had thousands of followers on Facebook, I'm not sure that I would think it was all that great, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, I, uh, and I think if I did have all that many people, if, you know, I mean, you know, maybe there are some people who are that much in demand, I would definitely use those lists and section people off and make sure that not everybody saw all that stuff. That's although I think everybody can see how many friends you have, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, yeah. I have something to say to that, what but before think? before we, you know, if I see some people getting ready to leave, please fill out those evaluation forms. Please, you know, Bonnie and I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit if there are other questions or comments. But but to your question, I think what's interesting is that Facebook started initially for a few years. It was just for college students. And it was just, you know, it was like the Facebook, or it was called something else kind of book, but I'll leave that for your imagination if you don't know. Um, and it was just supposed to be like, these are your classmates, and you can connect with them, and you can get to know what they're interested in. And it was just for students, and it was a personal one-to-one -one tool. Uh, then it evolved into something that was opened up to the general public, and then organizations and companies started using it. So here's a tool that was originally intended for personal connections that's now being used much more globally, and it's still having some growing pains. And every three months they change the user interface or they create new settings. So I feel like Facebook is like, it's, it's probably the demand is higher for it and they, they're trying to catch up. It's possible that in a few years we'll be over Facebook and onto something else or there'll be a pushback and a desire for more personal and intimate feelings and not this sort of, my life's out there for everyone to see. We don't know, I mean this is sort of the communication shifts that are happening are so rapid and people still use MySpace. And there are certain audiences um, and ages and genders and, and races and ethnicities that use MySpace more than Facebook. For example, teens, still really popular on MySpace, not Bands. so as much Facebook. Yeah. Bands, yeah. obviously, Mike yeah. My son's band is all yeah. over there. And that's so where they get so don't totally kids. discount it. But that said, depending on how, who, where your friends are is where these tools are. So it is, it's, it's a bit... It's hard. I mean, I think you, you can decide, maybe you don't want to put updates on that about what you believe in and you just want to talk to your friends. You could still accept people, but again, as Bonnie said, put them in certain groups. And you could also hide who shows up on your news feed, right? Yeah, if you only yeah, want to yeah. see what your yeah, friends yeah. are up to, you yeah. can do, use those settings. But it means spending the time to customize the tool for what you want it to do. So we have to wrap up. Thank you guys so much. This was yeah, great. Thank you, Let us know what you think. Yeah.